Okay. Hey, everybody. Craig Cottle, director of Nature Line School. We're going to be hanging out here for just a few moments to make sure everybody that wants to be here can get in. So uh, glad you joined us. Glad you're here. A lot of people have been asking us about uh, the computer. I'll talk about that while we're waiting on people to get in. What are all these stickers? Well, we've got our Nature Reliance School stickers going on here. Heal People Gear, fantastic stuff, as we discovered a couple weeks ago. Uh, this sticker right here is from Life Adventure Center, the Warrior Adventure Program. I did a lot of programs with them for and the Department of Defense. Uh, Miguel's Pizza, best pizza in the gorge. Uh, Alpha Battery from uh, Assassins. This is my son's basic training battery. Red River Gorge. Uh, the Kentucky Ambulance Providers Association, I did a four-hour lecture discussion a couple weeks ago on basically the same topics we're talking about tonight, situational awareness, and here's another one from Life Adventure Center, and grunt style. I dig me some grunt style t-shirts, so yeah, uh, somebody, somebody asked me, hey, what's all the stickers on, the, on your computer? Well, there you go. So yeah, tonight we are going to be talking about situational awareness, uh, how to handle yourself in an active aggressor, active shooter situation. And we have a large number of people that are part of our community that I'm, I'm sure are going to join us. And they'll have other things that we can uh, seek out from them and they'll add to the conversation. So here's what we wanted to do tonight first and foremost. And that is to go over what it is that all of us should be aware of in any active aggressor, active shooter situation. Obviously, this has come up because of what happened in Las Vegas. And it, for good reason, has given a lot of people pause on because, because of social media, because of the access of phones and cameras and all that. There's a lot of information that's been just thrown at us that we wouldn't normally see in such situations. And so people were wondering, what in the world should I do in that situation? Well, uh, there's two things that I want to cover. Well, there's a lot of things I want to cover. But there's two perspectives I want to make sure that we consider when we're doing this, and that is your average ordinary citizen, uh, what that person who doesn't have any training on self-defense or um, how to defend themselves, whether it's armed or unarmed, and your person that does have some training, and particularly um, focusing our attention on the wonderful things that our heroes in law enforcement do for us. So those are two different things because there's a lot of people that carry concealed that have a minute or small amount of training, and I'm sorry, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but unless you have extensive training in that situation, you should consider yourself average ordinary citizen, meaning you should be doing what you can to help those that are around you, okay? So in a nutshell, hey, Alfred, what's up? Can't stay, have a good talk, good work. Thanks, appreciate it. And Chris Hoke says, hey, D, who's D? So... Um, good. Thanks for the encouragement, guys. I'll try to hit up the comments here on a pretty regular basis. And I think I've got this figured out where I get everybody updated a little bit more regular here on the computer. So what I'll do, try to do a better job of coming back to and from these comments on a regular basis so that I can keep my train of thought and answer questions and give shout outs where I can. So here's what we need to understand from a, from a active shooter situation. Uh, FEMA, I think, is the originator of this concept, although the fundamental building blocks of it is true for any situation. And what they said was, as a means of teaching a simplistic method that's easy for people to remember. When I say people, I mean your average ordinary citizen. That is easy for them to remember. It is run, hide, and then fight. What I mean by run, hide, and fight is that in any active aggressor, active shooter situation, the best thing for you to do is to remove yourself and create a large time distance gap between you and the person that's trying to bring those that are around you and yourself harm. The farther the gap is, the longer the amount of time is between you and them, the more that you're moving, the less likely it is that you can be a target. So it's difficult for someone to to aggress and or make contact or shoot a moving target. So you being in movement is a, is a wonderful thing for you. So you need to run. So one of the things that came up is um, this idea of 
uh, of stampeding? Was there a number of people in Vegas in particular that were hurt due to uh, stampeding? We don't really know. And actually, that brings up a good topic. There's so many things that we don't know about what happened at Las Vegas. And it would be my encouragement to you that you wait until we get some more information from investigators on what actually happened, what if, what's the motive, and any number of things. So um, I should have brought that up at the very beginning. We, we jumped to so many conclusions, and all this conspiracy theory stuff comes up, and, and I think it's best that we just wait and see what we can get from invest, investigators. Well, that said, running is the best way for you to make yourself a harder target, okay? Hide means basically, hey, I can't run, I can't move any farther, I can't get away, I'm in a building or I'm in a venue where I don't know where the exits are, something of that nature, and you need to hide. So we need to understand the difference between cover and concealment. So one of the things, I went through a training several years ago on active shooter instructionals for public schools, and because at that time I was teaching a fair amount of that, for uh, for teachers as well as students. And one of the studies that came out was what sort of things provide best cover, okay? So if you can't remove children or you can't remove yourself from a venue such as this, where's the best place to hide? So cover is the best. Concealment obviously is not the best. Cover is where you have some sort of barrier between you and the shooter that can stop bullets. Concealment is where basically the sh shooter can't see you, but they can shoot through. You shoot through whatever barrier is between you and them. Uh, a barrier that it provides concealment is something like a chair or a table or maybe even drywall or something of that nature because those, that, those kinds of rounds, well, depending upon what they are, they can easily travel through drywall. So this study that came out for the school system said this, the absolute best barrier that you can put between you and an active shooter is earth. So if there's any way that you can put a hill you can put some sort of land-based anything between you and a shooter. It's going to be more difficult for those rounds to travel through the earth than it is anything else. Secondly, we need to look at concrete and brick because those are more dense and is more difficult for uh, rounds to travel through that than it is, again, something such as drywall. And then steel would be last. So we're looking at earth, bricks and concrete, and then we're looking at the steel of a door, for example, or something of that nature that we could get behind. So with that said, when we hide, we need to understand that our cover needs to be in that order, if at all possible. And then that's, it's not real technical. It's so obvious that we need to get down behind something that's going to provide a bigger barrier or a stronger barrier for us. Now, one item in particular that comes out of this particular situation is that the aggressor was in an elevated position. So you've got to imagine if this is the if this is the barrier you're down behind and you understand and this is incredibly difficult for your average person, okay? And and I'm throwing myself into this average person. I, I'm not a I've never been in battle. I don't have the I don't want to pretend that I'm something I'm not. But studying this academically and studying this with some really good instructors who have been in those situations, this is one of the things that comes out of it, is that if someone is shooting from an elevated position and you're down here, they can still see you rather easily. So if you, if you do recognize that the shooter has an elevated position, you want to hug up close to the cover because it's going to be more difficult for that shooter to be able to see you there. The opposite is true if they're down on the ground because if you hug up the, behind the cover, then the aggressor can be on you rather quickly. So you want to be out here where you can see that, cover, that aggressor and make contact when and if you can. And after that, fight. So you run, you hide, and then you fight. So fighting is where you either defend yourself with a firearm, you defend yourself with your hands, or whatever it is that you find handy around you in the area. Now. Here's what we need to understand is that your average, even your average ordinary police officer here in America, here's one of the things that, that I, is the reasoning why I look up to them because the way they approach this is just the opposite of what I just described. When they see that happening, they are going to be set, they're going to be doing all the, the running to the aggressor. They're going to be finding cover and then they're going to be fighting as well. So, but they're, they're, modus operandi is to go towards the threat and to do what they can to neutralize it. So another big reason why I'm a fan of 
law enforcement. With that said, I hope that makes stuff makes sense. I'm going to go to our comments and see what's going on here. Again, I think I made this clear, but if you go to our blog at naturereliance.org, then you will find the blog that has basically all the information that are my talking points that I'm utilizing tonight. And you can use that as reference for you to study yourself. Um, so here's some of the comments. Uh, looking at, hey, we got Mega City Trap, Kentucky. Yeah, Trap, Kentucky. Hey, Tony. Uh, some of the stuff that you see here, uh, particularly these Israeli bandages I'm going to talk about, I got from Tony. He's a good guy. Hey, Craig, I finally made it on here to see you. Hey, Jamie, what's up? Central Illinois and Virgil Lewis is from Lexington. And let me see. I'm missing some of the comments. Let me get to them here. I'm still getting better. I hope I'm getting better. Hey, while I'm working through finding all these comments, make sure you share this with somebody if you think somebody's interested in the topic. And remember, it'll be on the uh, Facebook page for quite a while under videos. So go look under videos. So right now, I am missing all those comments for some reason. I'm only seeing about four. But we'll see. I'll come back to them in a minute see what we can find. Um, with that said, uh, the next thing that we want to make sure that we take a look at is from basically just our behavior as a species, as mammals, as, you know, although we're humans and we have advanced thought processes, there are a lot of things that are basically in our genetic makeup that we're designed to do. And I want to talk about those as well because they help us with our situational awareness, particularly uh, what is referred to as normalcy bias. And remember, go to naturereliance.org. That's our website. It has all these words that I'm using that are the highlights. And that way you can type these into Google and do some studying on your own because there's a lot, of, a lot of information out there. But normalcy bias is how we go through our daily lives. We, we humans don't like change. And so because we don't like change, we want things to be normal. And so let's say that we're at a concert and we hear something that is actually gunfire. We want to normalize it and we don't want to make it to be gunfire because that requires a lot of stress, that requires a lot of change. And so what we do is we, we normalize it. And the way we normalize it is we go through our mind, our catalog of thoughts, and the technical term for that is schema, S-C-H-E-M-A. We go through our catalog of thoughts, our file folders, and we look for something that seems similar to what it is that's stressing us. In this case, you heard a lot of people saying it sounds like fireworks. I watched a video today prepping for what we're going to discuss tonight, and there were people literally standing in the middle of the venue, and there were rounds coming and hitting the blacktop, and they were arguing on whether that was a gun or not, whether it was a firearm or not. And there was so much argumentation that they were definitely losing the uh, losing their opportunity to leave. Now, fortunately, these two people did that they were arguing, but the, the normalcy bias put them in a situation where they could not think outside the box and they had to normalize what was going on around them. And the most normal thing they could come up to in their mind was fireworks. So um, that brings about another thing that comes about when this situation is herd mentality. Herd mentality, think of it like cattle. Uh, and maybe you've never been a cattle farmer. I've been a cattle farmer uh, quite a while, off and on. But if if the cows got out on the farm, if we if one of them got out and we had to bring it back, we didn't try to bring it back where we wanted to bring it back. We tried to put it back through the fence where it went out because it only knows where it came out. It doesn't know anything new. It's a dumb animal. And to agree to a degree, we work the same way. So in a situation where um, rounds are coming into a venue what happens to the herd, what happened to the large group of people is that they went back to a known, a known situation where, which is where they came in. So a lot of people went right back out where they came into the venue because that was a known, they were comfortable with it and they went that direction. So what I recommend people do in this situation is a couple of things. Um, I think I have my keys. No, I don't have my key right here. It's in my bag. But one of the things that this, if you ever look anywhere you go in public, you'll see the exit signs. Anytime I go anywhere, one of the first things I do when I go into a place that I'm not familiar with is I'm already scoping out where the exit signs are. Now, when you first start doing this sort of thing, you'll feel like you're a paranoid person. But once you do it more and more and more, it just becomes part of your nature and you're just more prepared. But I will find those exit signs 
And I will also look forward, depending upon the venue, the doors that say push only in the event of an emergency or whatever it is they say on them, because that is the door that you need to go out. You need to know where that door is. Most people, again, are going to go back to where they are comfortable, where they came in, because they that is a known. So without getting to the specifics of it, because I don't like talking about those things publicly, that is not good for you. What is better for you is for you to leave into an area that the shooter will not expect you to be going to because you don't want the shooter to expect you a certain place and you go that direction. The last thought on mammalian behavior, our behavior as, as a species, is this idea of fight, flight, or freeze. Now, a lot of people know what fight or flight is. Basically, you're presented with a dangerous or a stressful situation and you have the choice, just like a deer, for example, just like a wild turkey, for example, of fight or flight. So one of the things that a lot of mammals do, us included, is that we, instead of those two things, we will freeze. Here's why. If you understand why, maybe you can understand how to overcome it. So imagine that little bunny rabbit that's in your backyard or in the woods or wherever it is that you might see a rabbit. And you see that rabbit, and when you do, it sees you. And when it does, what's it do? It freezes. And the reason it freezes is because it knows that most of its predators can see it better when it's moving. There's a whole lot to this. We can talk about that on another day. But the way our eye works is we pick up movement. Okay, So that's why that rabbit freezes in that moment. Now, that doesn't mean that it's not eventually going to leave, but it'll freeze initially. We are much the same way. That's built into us because when we freeze, it's harder for our predators to see us as well. Now, in training, you can learn to get over that. That takes a fair amount of training, and that's why I say your typical average person, even your average ordinary concealed carry permit holder, needs to do something where you train on movement strategies under stress. It's incredibly valuable, and you've got to do it. Now, I, I say this all the time, but I train regularly with Iron Sight Defense out of London, Kentucky. You need to find somebody that has a vast amount of experience teaching people how to handle themselves under stress like that, particularly if you're a firearms carrier and know how to defend yourself. Okay, so with that said, I'm going to try to go back to some questions if I can pull them up this time. Yeah, we're getting there. So I hope you got some. You have some questions. And this is the perfect time for my computer to not be doing what it's supposed to be doing. As we can see, I'm still looking for you. Man, thanks for joining us, by the way. Hey, Cher, while I'm, while I'm doing my best to find this on Facebook, then do your best to uh, share it with other, peoples that you th other people you think might be interested in this topic. Thanks for doing this. Paris, Kentucky here. Hey, Bonnie, what's up? Peach tree joy. Hey, Shalina. Shalina. Hey, good to hear from you, Shalina. Glad you made it. Tracy Trimble, my brother in arms, Mr. Tracy Trimble. Tracy Trimble's an instructor with Nature Reliance School as well. He's good people. So, uh, hmm. again, we keep running into, hey, it looks like Josh Risen's in. Risen, if you have something to say, then throw it in here. Uh, one of the things that I did a few weeks ago was uh, I do what I can to support local law enforcement where I'm from, Winchester, Kentucky. Uh, I don't uh, I don't have the ability to do that often, but one of the things I get to do on occasion is play role player for them. And some of the stuff that we're going to discuss tonight, particularly when we get to medical gear, came out of some training where several of the guys from Winchester got tactical combat casualty care training, and I got to role play for them as they were training some guys in, in law enforcement. I don't want to talk about that training specifically, because that, that kind of stuff is for those guys, and you need to find good training, and I'll talk about that later too. But uh, some of the equipment that were that I would like to point out, some of the issues that came up that, uh, that we can have in our knowledge base that are going to help us if we ever have to deal with this situation. So as far as those behaviors that I was mentioning earlier that are problematic for us, there's some definitely some things that we can do to avoid basically falling into those traps. And the first is what I refer to as constantly monitor baseline. Now, baseline is something that, that is a word that comes up a lot as it pertains to um, modern tracking, man tracking, for example. And 
what that is is basically you look at an environment, whether it's a leaf litter in a forest or you're looking at a country music venue in Las Vegas or here in Lexington, Kentucky, it doesn't matter. You look at that venue and you can see that there's a certain rhythm, there's a certain thumping, there's a certain beat that's going on. And when you recognize that something is different from baseline, that's what I refer to as disturbance when we're tracking. It's the same as it, come, as it pertains to a large venue such as this. If you recognize that something is changing, then you probably need to be preparing to make a change yourself. So as I look into a crowd and you look into a crowd and you see all of a sudden there's this big expansion somewhere in the central area, there's probably some sort of fight, there might be an aggressor there, there might be some of that nature, or you see a large group of people that start moving from one side of the venue to the other, it's easy in that situation to get caught up in the normalcy bias and trying to focus on that and focus lock on it and make it something that it's not. What you need to do is start to immediately adapt to it and start to change. Now, one of the reasons that, or one of the ways that we can also uh, constantly monitor baseline and disturbances is what I refer to as the critical and in the survival classes, I talk about the survival, um, the survival rule of three. This, this is a military mindset that I, I got out of some study uh, many years ago. It was referred to as a combat rule three there. And basically what it says is that if you see three anomalies, three, three things that are standing out, for example, then you need to change what's going on around you or you could very easily suffer the consequences. Or if you have one single thing that is hugely different than the baseline, then you probably need to be making a change. I'll give you a perfect example. Let's say that, let's say you're in a situation where you're in a vehicle with somebody and you see somebody on the opposite side of the road that all of a sudden makes a U-turn and now they're behind you. That's number one. Let's say that that person is behind you, is riding right up on you and getting right on your bumper. That's anomaly number two. That's two things. And then let's say they start to then pull out and pass you. That's anomaly number three real quick like they jerk and pull real quick. Then you need to be making a change and not continuing to do what you're currently doing. Because if three anomalies jump out at you, then something is happening. Now, let's apply that to this situation in Las Vegas. You, see, you hear this sound that sounds like it could be gunfire, it could be fireworks. That's anomaly number one. You All of a sudden you see people that, for example, have fallen beside you and you have no explanation why multiple people have fallen behind, beside you. That's anomaly number two. Number three, you see a large swath of people that are moving. That's anomaly number three. If you don't start to do something at that moment in time, then you're setting yourself up to also become a victim. You need to understand that critical rule of three and then start to remove yourself from the situation. That's vital. So that's what I call the critical rule of three. And here's a, a fantastic thing that came out of this next point. And again, this is on the blog, naturereliance.org. Hey, please share this with anybody. I can't get to them. I keep... Read them to you? Yeah, read them to me because I've tried four times to get to the comments. Okay, Bonnie uh, Wall wants to know what type of items would have been helpful to have had. Okay, Bonnie, great question. All this stuff is what I'm going to talk about last, so I will have that. It's also in the blog piece at naturereliance.org. I'm going to talk about these specifically. There's some of these things that I would recommend for you to carry with you. There's some of them that are something that, when I say carry with you, I mean on you at all times. I carry with them on me at all times. There's some other things that we can carry in a kit that we might leave in our vehicle or something of that nature. Um, Got any more that I need to get to? For some reason, folks, I can't get to the questions on Facebook. So Show Faith Productions is helping me out here. Thanks, Bama. Yeah, uh, uh, Joshua Scott has a question, and if you want to repeat it, what type of intelligent would you, to intelligence would you recommend gathering for the good guys? Oh, great question. Josh Scott, Josh Scott is one of the guys that trains me on such topics. So He's, he's throwing me a bone here, and I appreciate you doing that, Josh, so we can talk about it. One of the things that he and I were talking about earlier, right after this happened, is let's say you go to that cover, okay? One of the things that you can immediately do, if you have good cover and you're protected, or you've left the situation and you're completely removed and you're safe, is what kind of information can I give to the good guys, okay? People like Josh Scott, because he's a guy that's going to be running towards the gunfire. He's that type of guy. 
Um, you want to get where the sound is coming from as best you can. Obviously, because of social media, we've seen that there's a lot of conflicting information. But if a number of people call and say, hey, it's coming from the Mandalay Bay Hotel on the upper floors, then that gives some information. If you have a description of the person that is doing the aggressing, then send that the direction of the police through dispatch. You can also try to uh, explain to the dispatcher, whoever receives the call, what's going on around you, what it looks like, and that way they can start to develop plans with medical assistance that's gonna come in later, and that way they can start preparing the EMTs, the paramedics, the hospital start prepping so they can get as much help as they possibly can. With that said, I wanna make sure that we're clear in this situation, you are going to be the person that's going to do most of the saving because of the intricacies of this situation. Most EMTs, paramedics, and firefighters will stage outside of something like this and not be able to go into a situation until it's safe. Unless those people are off duty and they're actually in the venue, you're going to be the one that's going to be doing most of the saving of yourself and those that you care about. And that's why we're going to talk about this. We got any more questions, Bama? Yeah. Uh, Tony, Thanks, Josh. Yeah, Tony Banks. Uh, mentioned that you know when you're in a restaurant, maybe you want to sit where you can see an exit. Yeah, Tony. Uh, Tony's a good guy. As I said, Tony, uh, I get a lot of this equipment from Tony for training, which I greatly appreciate. Um, so, what's Rodney Van Zant from? What are you saying, Ryzen? Do you see what Josh or uh, Josh Ryzen said on there? Fort Rucker, Alabama. Okay, I'm going to get to that question. Uh, I'm going to get to that comment in just a second, Rodney. Thank you for bringing that up. Okay, um, let's get back to what was the question, Bama? Sorry. Um, mentioned in, in a public place such as Oh, yeah, Tony. Restaurant. Tony, so, yeah, when you get to a restaurant, here's what I'm going to do. Number one, I'm going to walk into the restaurant. I'm going to see where the exits are. I'm going to know where those exits are. I'm going to look and know where the kitchen is because there's always an exit outside the kitchen as well. And the thing that I was going to show you on my on my uh, keychain is I have a rescue me device. That's a glass breaking device. It's specifically designed to be on your keychain so you can break windows out of a vehicle if you're in a, win in a vehicle and you can't get out or you need to get into a window. But here's how I also plan on using that in the event of an active aggressor. I like to, when I go to a restaurant, I like to be near a window so that I can see out and know what's going on. And number two, that is gonna be the exit door that I'm gonna create with my glass breaker. I'm going to go to the glass, I'm going to break it, and then I'm going to create my own exit door where there was not one right before that. So that's what I like to use or consider using my Rescue Me device. I've got a video over on, the, on another channel, just look at Rescue Me device, and you can see me busting out windows of all different sorts. Um, oh, okay, Josh got a call. Josh is on duty for Winchester, it sounds like. So, All right, Rodney, who is my uh, tactical sensei, says, went on vacation or attending event, what information do you gather before you attend, i.e. hospital location, exits, etc.? I think I just covered that, Rodney, but thanks for bringing it up. It doesn't matter what the event is. I want to make sure that I understand where those exits are, and I want to understand again, let's, emphasize, let, let's make sure we emphasize this. I want to know where those exits are that are different from the area that I came into. Herd mentality is going to push, push people back to the way they came in, because that's the familiar area, that's what mammals do, that's what we do, and so what we want to do is know where those emergency exits are and that's where we're going to go. Also, one of the things that Rodney has us do in, um, in our classes at Iron Sight Defense is he always has a risk management assessment at the beginning of every class. It's a good habit to be in for anybody, uh, particularly when it comes to communications. For example, um, he has the keys in a vehicle. He tells us in a class, hey, we're going to take, if somebody gets hurt, we're going to put them in that vehicle. The hospital is here. It's about this amount of time away. We do have cell service here or we don't. Those are the things that I'm looking for wherever I go. I want to make sure I understand whether I have cell service or not. I want to know where that hospital is so I can get myself on the way there. And in, in that manner, we're going to get myself and those that I care about as much help as we possibly can. So... One of the things that, uh, is that a question? One of the, one of the folks asked the question, should you play dead? It, if you're not moving, you are more of a target. The better solution is for you to be moving and getting a, an increased time distance gap from those people that are around you. 
particularly that aggressor. Um, so make sure that you want to get away. Now we've seen a lot of, you know, situations where this happens in the movies, but in real life, I think the best thing that we can do is to create a time distance gap and get a larger distance. Because again, if we're on the move, we are much harder target than we are than, uh, if we're sitting still. All right. Now, beyond that, as far as going back to what Rodney was saying, is that know where that hospital is and have a communications plan. So here's one of the things that, again, when you first start doing this, it's going to seem like you're paranoid. But after you do it for a while, uh, you're going to get used to doing this. Like when my family, when we go anywhere, we talk about, hey, if something happens, we're going to meet right there. And if I get there and you're not there, we're going to meet right here. There's always a contingency plan of this is where we're going to go. Now, particularly, let's say, for example, uh, like, for example, my wife and I went out to visit my son in Oklahoma. I'm not real familiar with Oklahoma. We stopped at a hotel. We stayed in a hotel. First thing we did is we dropped our bags off in the room, and then we went and looked for the exits. We also looked in the area where we could leave and go and find cover. And we also looked at contingency areas where we could go and find cover. That way, if something happens and we get separated, a lot of times cell phone communications are not going to work and we're so dependent upon them that uh, if they don't work, it stresses us even more. So we want to do everything that we can to have plans that are already, as Alfred Felker says on here, setting up pre-planning so that we know what to do under stress. Okay, so there, I think I'm getting the questions. Anything I'm missing there? I have no idea. I have no idea, Bama, how, how, what I'm missing. Um, Todd Gibson, yeah, I am seeing Todd Gibson's for how many, okay, I'm only seeing like four, isn't it weird? weird? All right, so how many injuries were from being trampled? I don't know that yet, and I haven't seen any data on that. It's a good question, Todd. Uh, in tight spaces with way too many people, small exits, it seems most people are injured, killed from being trampled. I agree with that. Find cover, hold up for the exits to clear, and for the police to stop the bad guys. Again, uh, I can't say enough that the police are the professionals. They're the ones that handle the situation. So as much information we can throw them through dispatch, the better off they're gonna be able to do their job. So to me, there's been some criticism that I think is purely and totally unfounded, but the short amount of time it took a, a dedicated team to stack up and get on the door where this bad guy is, is miraculous. And I'm confident it's because there was somebody in a room next door that could hear it, and they, he fed the information to dispatch. There are other people that were feeding information saying it was coming from high ground. And so that team was able to, to get where they needed to be simply because people got to safe positions, they got to cover, or they were already in cover, and they were then able to contact dispatch and give good information. And dispatch did a good job of passing that information on to the guys that needed it. Hey, Don Flowers. Um, usefulness, practicality of backpack armor plates. I can't, I can't uh, say enough good things. If you're not aware, there's a lot of armor plates that people are getting that are really lightweight. And I'm sorry, Don, if you know the manufacturer of these, because the name escapes me right now, you can actually put in your kid's backpack. You can carry in a small bag and it provides armor protection for you. It's not huge. It's not perfect, but it is a whole lot better than nothing at all. And so these are things, and, and when I say you can put them in a kid's backpack, they're, they're large enough to provide some protection, but not so heavy. And, and the technology is fantastic how much armor protection they can put in a lightweight apparatus now that you can throw in a kid's backpack. You can put it in your computer bag or any number of things. So I think those are valuable. I'm a big fan of those things, Don, so, or uh, Kelly. So thanks for bringing that up. Um, moving on, let's get back to our notes so I'll make sure I get... Uh, get everything covered tonight. All right, so the next thing on how to avoid all those problems, uh, there's one book out there called Left to Bang, Patrick Horn and somebody else, I can't remember. But basically, it, it comes from a combat mentality or, or a military uh, situation where let's, uh, let's look at it this way. Let's say we've got, we've got, a, we've got the time continuum here. And let's say we, we can see the future, but we know that right here is where the bad situation occurs, where basically the active sh shooter starts, um, starts shooting. This is where we are before that happens. This is where we are after it happens. So this is what we want to do. If this is the bang, we want to be left of bang. 
meaning we want to be proactive. We do not want to be reactive because once you're in a situation re, re, where you are reactive, there's a lot of bad things that are happening to you physiologically under stress. You have auditory exclusion. Uh, sometimes you get tunnel vision, your blood pressure rises, your heart rate rises. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago. But when all those things start to occur physiologically to you, you can't make good sound decisions unless you've trained to do that, unless you've been under stress and do that. So Rodney's a good guy to learn that from. But we want to be over here. That's why we want to understand that critical rule of three. That's why we want to have situational awareness so that we can recognize that things are happening left of the bang before they actually occur and and be able to be proactive about it rather than reactive about it. Now, Left of Bang is a book that comes from the Combat Hunter Corps, the United States Marine Corps. Horn was a um, um, former service Marine who wrote the text Left of Bang. Um, Combat Hunter Program is for military personnel only, but uh, Left of Bang is a book that any civilian can get. You can get it off Amazon. Um, next is Understanding Shima Miss... Miss uh, blah, blah. When I'm not drinking enough water, I don't talk well. So I will slow down so I talk better. But understanding Shema is basically, Shema is where you have a catalog of files in your brain. And these file folders are full of information. Whenever we see something that we're not sure of, we go through these file folders. We talked about this in our Scout Tracker class two weeks ago. When you're looking through those file folders, trying to figure out, is that a human laying there or that is not, it, you go back to what you already know. Same thing is true in a situation like this. When you hear something, if you're not familiar with hearing the sound of it and what it is, you'll, uh, you'll immediately attribute it to something in your catalog of files, in your, your filing cabinet, in your brain, of what it seems like to you. For example, these people said it was fireworks when it was actually gunfire. This is one of the reasons, again, I keep bringing Rodney up, but he's one of the greatest teachers I've had on a lot of this subject matter. I, I, I trained and taught people martial arts and situational awareness and self-defense for a long time, but it was only when I started studying with Rodney that he started applying these things to a, a, to a higher level of my understanding. And one of the things that he had us do was he had us get on the range one day while we had somebody shooting downrange. We were downrange of the fire, not directly in front of it, but downrange, and the the rounds were going over us so that it was the first time I'd heard it, I'd read this, but I'd never actually heard what a round sounds like as it's coming through and past you. If you're on one side of it, it sounds like a boom, but if you're on the downside of it, it sounds like a whip crack. It sounds really different than when you're on the other side of the gun. And because, because of that, I can now recognize, wow, that is a bullet that's coming towards me. If you're not familiar with that, then you can go, what was that? and you're standing there, and that's when it's easy to become a target. If you hear that, you need to be on the move. And so understanding that, and if you watch these videos of what happened in Vegas, you can, if, if you're familiar with it, you can actually hear that whip crack of the rounds coming through the air at people that are holding the camera. So it's interesting. Now, uh, do I have any more questions that I'm missing there, Bama? Oh, Rodney, thanks for putting up our inside defense. I'm going to be training with Rodney this weekend. So, uh, Anthony Cummins, well, I happen to live in Rock Castle. Well, Anthony, you need to check out our inside defense. <laughs> Please do. So, run, hide, fight, or fight, fight, fight. Yeah, Paul, I agree with you 100%. Uh, one of the things I want to make sure that we understand is that, again, people that are well-trained may go quickly to fight. All of us, we need to move, we need to get cover, and we need to fight. But those that are trained may have the ability to uh, engage somebody of this nature. Just keep in mind, th th we, this, this is what we must understand as those that are watching our concealed carry permit holders. In this situation, I'm sorry, I don't think there's anybody that could engage that guy in, on the 32nd floor of the hotel. I think it's unrealistic. And basically, if you were, what would have happened is you would have looked like a bad guy. And when you look like a bad guy and you're shooting, then when you look like a bad guy, if you don't do what the law enforcement officer tells you, then you become the bad guy in their mind. They're under stress. They're well-trained. Most of them are incredibly well-trained. And so they have to make the decision, hey, there's this guy shooting at people. They don't know that you're actually a good guy. You're the good guy. So in that situation, it's better to leave and 
and feed information to the good guy so because they're on radios they're communing communicating they have the ability to communicate more effectively than an average ordinary concealed carry permit holder that's on their own so just be aware anytime that you have to utilize a weapon for self-defense do not ever do not ever go against whatever law enforcement officer is telling you to do because if they see you with a weapon they do not know if you're the good guy or the bad guy and you need to follow their directions one school that I went to, when we would go out for self-defense training, they would make us literally drop our weapon. That's hard to do for a lot of people, but I think that's really good training. Um, Lee Farley says, how do you know which way to move? Okay, that's where we've got to go back. No, that's when we've got to go back to, to knowing where the exits are. Moving in and of itself is better than not moving. So we need to move and we need to go where those, those exits are that we've done our pre-planning for and we know where they are. So that's a good question. Uh, Todd said, hey, Todd, I had not talked to you in a while. I had not seen you in, in, on Facebook in a while. No one in that venue could fight back. Yeah, that was pretty difficult. Um, in that situation, I don't know that anybody could have fought back. He, uh, the only people able to fight back against a guy that is in an elevated position with a rifle is somebody else with a rifle, in my opinion. Uh, I'm not incredibly well trained on that stuff, but that's my personal opinion in that particular uh, instance. So, yeah, good questions, you all, and good comments from a lot of people that are very well trained and, and have been my teachers all along, so I really appreciate that. Now, let's get back to what it is that we came here to talk to you about, which I greatly appreciate it. Hey, if everybody doesn't mind, share this with somebody. Please do that. That helps get the word out. And again, you can share this after the show is over. And if you'll notice on the blog pieces for the uh, shows previously up to this, then uh, I've, I uh, show Faith Productions that helps me make all this happen. He showed me how to download those videos from Facebook, and now I've uploaded them to YouTube. And now they're on YouTube, and they can be shared inside the blog pieces. So you have the information that I'm utilizing as my talking points, and you have the old videos right there for you. So you can reference those and share those with people too, which we greatly appreciate. Now, um, getting back to that, let's talk about kits. All right, so first off, tourniquets. There are two main styles of tourniquets that I want to recommend to you because these are the ones that I've been shown, that I've been trained with, and I am not qualified to show you how to utilize these. I have had about four classes now on basically um, trauma care or tactical combat casualty care and but I'm not qualified to teach you but I do want to talk about some items and I have a listing on the blog piece on places where you can get training as well you have what's referred to as cat okay cat is a combat um, well I went totally stupid somebody tell me what combat uh, cats I went totally stupid <laughs> so anyway combat application tourniquet alright so basically what you have here is a tourniquet that has a small buckle on it, a lot of Velcro on it. You crank the windlass down. Once you crank the windlass down, it goes into place, and then you have a Velcro piece that goes over and helps keep it in place. Okay. The second one, which is my personally my favorite, is what's referred to as a soft tourniquet, Special Operations Forces Tactical Tourniquet, S-O-F-T-T. -T. Yeah, application. Thanks, Todd. Good gravy. Um, we had, a couple of years ago, we had two guys in class, I think it was a survival class, that were Cav Scouts, and they talked about these cats. And I'm not talking about the, the uh, counterfeit ones. I'm talking about the actual made-in-the-factory cats tourniquets that the windlass handle broke on them. So when, when they told me that, I just got away from them. I'm not saying they're bad, but I got away from them. Um, the guys down at Memphis that I trained, I trained them in survival, but they're all special response units from the Memphis Fire Department. If you don't know, that's like a war zone down there. So these guys are using this type of equipment on a regular basis. Basically, the way this works is similar to a, a cat's tourniquet, but the beauty of this one, and this is what I want to point out, is that the newer versions of this, this buckle comes apart so you can wrap it around the leg or the arm and put it on, crank the windlass, after you crank the windlass, you then place it in this 
triangular looking piece and that keeps it tight. Again, that is not, I'm not teaching you how to use that. I'm just showing you the basic mechanism so that you can go out and find some good training on your own and I'll discuss on how to do that in a minute. But one of the things that, Darren Marlowe, how can a guy bring that many guns in a room without being noticed? Maybe hotel staff needs to be taught awareness. You know, that might be very well true, Darren, but I would also submit to you and everybody else, because there's been a lot of discussion on this, is that this guy had been there for three or four days. He probably broke those weapons down and put them in suitcases and put them on a cart and took them up the elevator. Um, you know, it wouldn't be that difficult to do that, in my opinion. But um, so um, that that is something that I think will probably come out of this is teaching people how to be more aware of uh, of uh, what's called kinesics, proxemics, and any number of things. Basically, kinesics is body language. Can you read body language? Um, law enforcement officers are really good at that. Proxemics are the the distancing between you and other people and how they work a room, how they appear in a room, and what kind of things, the way somebody is in a room and the way people hold their body and the tails that everybody, you know, the nervous tics that people have that demonstrate that they're not feeling comfortable. So I think that's something that, that that's something we teach. Again, we taught a four hour lecture on this uh, two weeks ago to the uh, Kentucky State EMS conference. It was long, that's a long four hours, but I think it's good for all of us to be able to read people better. And so if you have law enforcement friends who have an opportunity to study that sort of thing, then I highly recommend doing it. It's good stuff. Um, getting back to this equipment though, Tourniquets had had bad had a bad reputation for a long time, and one of the things that has come out of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan is that's unfounded. Um, what there, there's a lot of data out there. It's in my first book. It's actually going to be in my second book too that I'm writing, and that's why I haven't been on Facebook and YouTube much because I'm neck deep in writing the second book. Um, but these things are great pieces of equipment, and again, I'm going to share with you where you can get some training with them. Some of the other things that I think you should carry with you is an Israeli bandage. Basically what you have here is you have a dressing that you can put over a wound. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago when we talked about medical gear then too. But you, I think you can understand now a little bit more why this sort of thing is really important. The beautiful thing about this dressing is that you can put it over the, the, the wound site, for example, and, and I demonstrated this two weeks ago, so watch that video, place it on you, and then it holds pressure on the wound. We all know that we can slow bleeding down by putting pressure on the wound site. Basically, if the wound is here, we want to do it between the wound site and the heart. So if the wound is right here, heart is right here, we want to put pressure on the, on the arm in this direction. Uh, make sure that we're putting pressure on the wound site. So an Israeli bandage will do that for us. I have a video just on that as well, so you can look that up. Uh, nasal pharyngeal airway opening, talk about that in a minute. But these two pieces of equipment, and meaning a tourniquet, Israeli bandage, and a hemostatic gauze. This happens to be combat gauze made by Quick Clot. This is a brand name, Quick Clot Combat Gauze. It's more expensive than your typical hemostatic gauze, but they both do the same thing. Basically, they force the clotting process um, to occur more rapidly. So something like this, stuffed into a wound site and there's a particular way to do it. I'm not qualified to show you how to do that. You need to get good training. You'll notice I keep saying that because it's important. Then combat gauze is something that you need to have. This kind of stuff when rolled up tightly, I've got this out for display for our discussion now, but rolled up tightly easily, easily can fit in a back pocket. So for example, the Israeli bandage comes in a package that looks like this. I'm a big fan of immediately taking that outer package off because it comes also in another vacuum sealed package. You can leave it like this because this is vacuum sealed and doesn't take much space. This is another reason I like wearing like something along the lines of cargo or 5'11 pants and shorts is because I can easily carry these items in a cargo pocket and it doesn't even affect anything. It's really easy to keep, um, keep, uh, keep in my pocket. Um, as far as some other supplies, a little bit more advanced, but they need to be discussed because they're important, is uh, Halo chest seals. Again, I'm not qualified to teach, although I have been trained on how to utilize these, I'm not qualified to show you how to, to carry these. Um, hemostatic gauze I talked about, chest decomp needle, which is another item um, that is important. And it's all in that kit here. Now, here's one. 
This is what a chest decomp needle looks like. It's in a case here, so it's safe. But again, you need to have training on how to utilize that. And uh, last but not least, let's talk about gloves. So I've talked to several people since I first heard this, but uh, it, anybody has an opinion on this, throw it out there. I am a big fan of using colored gloves, not black ones. Black ones are tactical. They look sexy and all that cool stuff. But my experience, no, well, I'm sorry. I have a little bit of experience with this. My knowledge that I then tried to find a way to develop experience with, which means I put deer blood on my hands with black gloves on at night, it is difficult to see blood on black gloves at night. So one of the gentlemen that taught me ta uh, um, tactical combat casualty care was all about getting really brightly colored gloves so that when you do your sweeps on the body looking for blood, you'll sweep and look at your hand, literally look at your hands, sweep, look at your hands. And when you do that at night with black gloves on, it's hard to see that blood. Again, the jury's out on that. I've heard people talk about different uh, opinions on that. That's just one point of consideration. It doesn't really matter to me um, what you do. I think you just need to do what you want to do. Uh, so if you look at the blog post, naturereliance.org, right at the bottom of the gear listing, you'll see several places that are places where you can get this equipment. TACMED Solutions, Imminent Threat Solutions, H&H &H Medical Solutions. TACMED Solutions has basically a good portion of the kit all in one. Uh, I got a Hill People Gear kit the other day, had some not not necessarily hardcore trauma equipment. It had a good it had a good set of kit in it. Um, TACMED Solutions and Imminent Threat Solutions are fantastic places to get basically everything. As I'm looking at it, for you law enforcement officers out there, you can get a a tourniquet holder that looks and fits with your duty kit, your duty belt. And they make these in all kinds of the different patterns that'll match your kit. So that's something else. As far as training is concerned, um, here's some places you can get training. Lone Star Medics, Knowles, National Outdoor Leadership School, Wilderness Medicine Associates, The Skinny Medic is a guy on Facebook, talks about stuff all the time. And at some point in time in the near future, we've got a lot of Got a lot of good stuff coming up with Nature Alliance School. We're going to have a class on tra trauma care, combat casualty care as well. Uh, we've got some really good people that want to assist us with that, so we'll make that happen. So that's it. What I want to do is go through and make sure I don't have any questions that I need to be answered. Uh, Todd, who is a friend of mine who's in the military, he used the basic blue nitrile gloves. That's good stuff. Josh, who's one of the guys that trained me, he's one of the instructors I was mentioning earlier. You can see blood on the black gloves. I like the blue or orange. Um, uh, Todd, again, is in the military. Israeli pressure dressings and Hemcon bandages would help, too, for major bleeds. Hemcon. Uh, is that, hey, Todd, if you're still here, is that, um, is that just a hemostatic gauze? So put that answer up there for us. And... That is all I can see. What am I missing, Bama? I don't know why I'm only getting four comments at a time. I'm missing a bunch of them. Got them all? All right, so uh, Ryzen, again, a, a good friend of mine who's a police officer and, again, has taught me a lot. Of, he was one of the guys that led the tactical combat casualty care class that I recently went through and was, was able to provide um, assistance by being a, a dummy. <laughs> An officer down, basically. I carry a tourniquet on duty and off. Fister flat pack off duty and the same tourniquet holder you had there on duty. So he's wearing this on duty. And he showed me, the last time I saw Josh, he showed me this Fister flat pack. And it works fantastic to lay a tourniquet down flat and makes it really easy to get to. It's really easy to uh, conceal so you don't, you don't bring a lot of attention to yourself. And Jim Bohannon has said another great video. Thank you, sir. Oh, thank you, Jim. Can't do this stuff without you all. That's for certain. Um, uh, Anthony says good stuff, Greg. Cool. I'm glad to help. Yeah, Anthony. I appreciate you watching, man. Really appreciate it. Um, so, yeah. Um, this, again, video. Hemcon, Bandage Pro, Tricol Biomedical. Thank you, Todd, for throwing that up there. Hey, you all, listen to me. Are you listening? This is what this is all about. I do not know it all. 
I have a way of doing things. It is not the way of doing things. I really look at this sort of thing as being a community event. I'll be the guy that gets up and yap my jaws, and I'm happy to do that because I love sharing skills with people and making people safer and more comfortable, particularly in the outdoors. Um, but when it comes to something like this that I feel that I've gained a tremendous amount of help from really qualified people, it's interesting. Most of those people came on here and added stuff in there. That's what a community is about. That's what Nature Reliance School is all about, is uh, sharing skills. So we really appreciate all the guys that came on here. Take a look at the comments. A lot of these guys have thrown in comments here with more information that you can uh, refer to. The video is going to be here on Facebook. I'm also going to upload it to YouTube probably in the next couple days, and it'll be attached to the blog so you can reference it at a later date. So, Jeremy Williams, you're welcome. Appreciate it. Thanks for watching. Really appreciate it. After this is over, you all, please share it with other people that you find that uh, may be interested in this topic. And uh, we're going to do our best to listen to what it is that you want us to do. And we'll provide these live events in that manner. We are working out some kinks to maybe do these um, some of these outdoors. So we'll figure out how to get that done for you. And that way we can do some of the topics that are in our wheelhouse and share that with you and uh, in, the, in the near future. But until then, look at the blog piece to find some training near you. Those training uh, organizations that I listed there, they're all over the country, so you can find some. Also, I highly recommend getting uh, first aid certified through American Heart Association and, um, and or Red Cross. Not because they're great, but if you've never had any sort of first aid training, that is a great way to get started, and I highly recommend it. Uh, for this sort of thing, you need to get some more training, though, way beyond what they're going to be able to offer you, and so you need to find somebody that's going to do that for you as well. And for all you law enforcement officers out there, it was just emphasized to me one more time as if I needed it. I cannot thank you enough for the work that you do. You EMS providers, I cannot thank you enough. You firefighters, I cannot thank you enough for what you do. I'm going to put all this stuff up. I'm going to load it into my truck. I'm going to go home. I'm going to go to bed, and I'm going to lay down, and I'm going to rest well because you people are out doing what you do, and I, I really appreciate it. Uh, I really appreciate everything you guys do. Um, some of you guys have trained me. That's why I'm being able to share information. Some of you guys are just provide the safety net that I get to walk around and go to bed in every night. And I can't thank you enough. My family can't thank you enough. So uh, watching those videos and watching these law enforcement officers go into that stuff, uh, it just, it's, it's uh, eye opening. And obviously all you military folks can't thank you enough. Keep doing what you're doing and uh, I'll keep doing what I'm doing because I know that I do it under the safety net you provide. So with Nature Reliance School, come on, join in. Let's learn together.